Well, good morning. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. The book of Isaiah chapter 9. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible under the row of chairs in front of you. Uh, If you can grab a Bible, we're going to be in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 this morning. Uh, Today is the third Sunday of Advent. And if you are unfamiliar with the concept of Advent, what Advent is, it's, it's simply the time of year before Christmas, uh, really at the start of the, the church calendar year, uh, when we celebrate the first coming of Jesus while we anticipate the second coming of Jesus. Advent gets us to reflect on Jesus' first coming while we expect Jesus' second coming. And we hold these two uh, comings in tension with one another. And the reason why it's important for us to recognize Advent, you know, if we're getting to the the core uh, of it, um, is is because it gives us the opportunity to slow down in a time when uh, Christmas, the the Christmas season is busy. It gives us the opportunity to slow down and to realize that our story is more than just what we have going on at Christmas. Our story finds itself in God's story. Our story finds itself in the the greater biblical narrative that is God's story. Uh, We can get so caught up in the Christmas season that we completely miss what Christmas is all about. We we buy gifts and we do these various family activities and traditions, which are all good things. God's given them as good gifts to his children for us to enjoy, so long as we don't miss the real meaning of Christmas. Christmas. Now, just this last week, Helena and I watched a good Christmas classic, A Charlie Brown Christmas. Maybe you're familiar with the movie. Uh, But the pivotal part of the movie is when Charlie Brown, who is frustrated with the commercialization of Christmas, laments, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And his friend Linus famously responds by reciting Luke 2, 8 to 14, which says, And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And Linus concludes, by saying, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Now, if we, don't, if we don't have this perspective in view, then Christmas is whatever we make of it, really. But if Christmas is about the Savior of the world who was born over 2,000 years ago, then, then everything is put in its proper place, and, and we have something to celebrate If the coming of Jesus to this world is really what Christmas is all about, then we buy gifts, not because we want to receive something in return or we want the accolades or anything like that, but because of the ultimate gift that was given to us. We do various family activities and engage in these various family traditions because we want to spend time focusing on the birth of Christ with the ones we love. Whatever our story is, wherever we are at in life, Advent reorients our hearts and our minds to the greater story that our story finds itself in. And throughout Advent, we've been looking at these various Advent themes. On the first Sunday of Advent, we saw how we can have a hope that is greater than our circumstances. On the second Sunday of Advent, we saw how we can have joy in the face of the curse that is on this world. And this morning we will see how we can have peace when there might be no sign of peace. This morning we will see what the angels meant when they talked about peace on earth. What does that look like? Because the reality is you you turn on the news and, and things don't seem very peaceful, do they? There's violence, there's protests, there's natural disasters, and, and all of it causes us to ask 
ask the question, what peace? Because things don't look very peaceful. There are those wrestling with anxiety. How, how do they find peace? Or how about those with loved ones in the hospital? Or those with a, a negative diagnosis? Or those who are in the process of moving? Or those who are financially strapped? Where is their peace this time of year? Maybe we have some interesting family dynamics that make things interesting when it comes to Christmas time. Maybe we are worried that family won't come over to our house for Christmas dinner, or maybe we're worried that we won't be invited. Maybe we are anxious about how the food will turn out. Maybe we're concerned that someone won't like our gift. Maybe we're worried about the road conditions. Whatever it might be, maybe peace is eluding us this morning and maybe this Christmas. And then there are those who try to have an answer for peace. Maybe getting rid of God and religion will bring peace to this world. Or maybe we just need to get rid of our defenses and, and then we will have peace. We look at the pronouncement of the angels that there is peace on earth with the birth of this child and we marvel at it. But what does it really mean for us today? What does it mean for us when we don't think there is peace on earth? Well, if you have your Bibles open to Isaiah chapter 9, let's read verses 1 to 7 to find out, to, to give us a, maybe an answer to this question. But there will be gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The prophet Isaiah is writing of a time in the future uh, when the Messiah, the promised one of God, would come to establish everlasting peace on the earth. Sounds nice, doesn't it? The Messiah would be the prince of peace who would come to break all human oppression. Sounds like something we, we all want. But the Hebrew word for peace here, used in this passage, is shalom. Shalom. Maybe you've uh, heard this word, maybe you've never heard this word, and now you know a Hebrew word, so you can... You know, leave here with that. But the way this word is used here, the word shalom, is more than the, just this idea of an absence of conflict or war. In the Jewish mind, peace or shalom speaks of a completeness or fullness, to, to be entirely and completely at peace with oneself. Uh, I, I'm not one for, uh, for conflict. I don't know if that's just my Mennonite roots uh, coming out or what, but, but I get uncomfortable when I am around conflict. Um, I, I remember when uh, Helena and I took this conflict management style test where you answer all these questions and then you're assigned an animal that identifies with the conflict management style that you are. Her and I, we thought this would be fun to do together. And I think we were dating at the time. So this makes it even better. 
Because we both took the test and we found out that I was an accommodating teddy bear. I sound really cute, don't I? Which meant that I try to, to smooth over conflict to prevent damage to the relationship. So that, that was, that was my, my result. Helena, on the other hand, uh, she was a forcing or competing shark. <laughs> which meant that she would try to get opponents to accept her solution to the conflict, sometimes by force. <laughs> and so you, you can imagine what that looks like, right, with the, uh, the teddy bear being torn to shreds by the, by the shark. But no, no, Helena's not, Helena's not like that. Don't worry. <laughs> if anything, we, we probably switched roles. I don't know. Or we're both accommodating teddy bears now. We, we're both trying to smooth over conflict. But, uh, but at the time, I, I, would, I would be at peace with no conflict because for me, it means that the relationship is good right? Uh, But that's not the way the Jews viewed peace. Peace. Peace was not the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of something else. Shalom was considered to be the way everything should be, but wasn't. It it was always something to be desired. And so they'd say, you know, shalom as, as a greeting to one another. Peace be upon you. Or we're looking for peace together. And in this passage, we're introduced to a prophecy that would make this desire for peace a reality. And we find out why this passage would have mattered so much to the Jews of Isaiah's day, because Isaiah is writing this to a particular people at a particular time. You see, as Isaiah is giving this prophecy of the events that were to come, the, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel was being invaded. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29, it says that, uh, a guy by the name of Tiglath Pileser. He was the king of Assyria. He came and he captured all the land of, of Naphtali, which is in the, the northern kingdom of Israel. And he carried, uh, he carried the people captive to Assyria. And so why this is so significant is because Naphtali is the name, of course, in one of the tribes of Israel mentioned in verse one of our, our passage. They would experience anguish. And so we see that they did experience anguish. But notice that Isaiah writes in verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And what Isaiah is saying is that God is not going to leave his people in anguish. God is going to come for them, and he will be their light in the darkness. Right now, it's, it's dark and hopeless, but guess what? A son will be given, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and guess what? Prince of Peace. And when the Prince of Peace comes, do you, do you see what he will do? He will increase their joy. He will break their oppression. He will cast the battle attire into the fire, because it's not necessary anymore. That's That's what the people of God were holding on to. They were waiting for the day when the Messiah would come to be their prince of peace. Fast forward a few hundred years, the uh, the southern kingdom of Judah has since experienced its own exile, its own tribulation, as it were. Uh, They were taken over by Babylon, and Babylon was taken over by the Medes and the Persians, and the Medes and the Persians were taken over by the Greeks, and then the Greeks were taken over by Rome. And when you get to the New Testament, the Jews are under Roman rule, and they've gone through hundreds of years of, of oppression and war. They're kind of in the middle of it. They've gone from oppressor to oppressor to oppressor. And all throughout this, they've held on to the promise that the Messiah is coming. He's coming. And when he comes, he will bring peace. The the long sought after commodity that they wanted. And then finally, finally, because you can imagine, right? They're holding on to this for hundreds of years, not knowing when the Messiah is going to come. And then finally, verse six comes to pass. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. I don't want us to miss this because it it matters a whole lot. What kickstarts 
the fulfillment of this prophecy of peace is not what we do to get to God. It's what God did to get to us. It's not what we did to get to God. It's what God did to get to us. John 3, 16 famously says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God gave his child, his son, to us. So don't, don't miss this. God didn't just leave his people to figure it out on their own. He entered our space. He became like one of us so that he could save us. It's the, the good news of the gospel. Um, D- David Platt, a uh, pastor of McLean Bible Church in Washington, D.C., DC. He, uh, he shared a, this illustration in a sermon that I had heard recently. Uh, he said that he was sitting outside a, a Buddhist temple in Indonesia having a conversation with a Buddhist leader and a Muslim leader uh, in this particular community. And he said that these men were discussing how all religions are, are fundamentally the same and only superficially different. One of the men said, uh, we, we have different views about small issues, but when it comes down to essential issues, each of our religions is the same. And he listened for a while as they talked, and then they asked him what he thought. And here's what he said. He said, it sounds as though you both pictured God or, or whatever you view as God at the top of a mountain. It seems as if you believe we are all at the bottom of the mountain and I may take one route up the mountain and you may take another route up the mountain and in the end, we'll all be in the same place at the top of the mountain. And they smiled and replied, exactly, you understand. Then he leaned in and said, now let me ask you a question. What would you think if I told you that the God at the top of the mountain actually came down to where we are. What, what would you think if I told you that God doesn't wait for people to find their way to him, but instead he comes to us? They thought about that for a moment and then responded that, well, that would be great. And David Platt replied, let me introduce you to Jesus. Church, let's not forget the gospel in the Christmas story because it, it's at the core of the Christmas story. The, the God at the top of the mountain did not leave us to find our way to him. He came to us, and he came to us as a baby in a grungy manger in the days when peace seemed out of the picture. In fact, right after Jesus was born, Herod, uh, who was called the king of the Jews, he was the, the leader in that area, He had every child under two years of age killed because he couldn't stand the thought of another potential king of the Jews out there, even though he was a baby. So Jesus is born into the midst of of chaos and brokenness and unrest and death. He's born into a time when everything is far from peaceful. And all the while, he is coming to us to bring us peace. Peace. We, we think about our own situations, right, and, and where we're at and, and the, maybe the lack of peace that, that we have with whatever we have going on. And, and Jesus came to bring us peace. And so we, we ask the question, you know, how can this child do this for us? What's, what's so special about this baby? And it's because he's caught in the flesh. He's the promised Messiah. He's the one who would come to be our Prince of Peace. He's the one who was talked about in that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9. So then the follow-up question is, where is this peace? We, we know that we all still struggle to find peace in the world, so, so where is it? What, what did Jesus come to earth to bring? What, what does shalom look like now? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, turn over in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus about who they are and what they have received in Christ. And so we get to this section of Scripture where Paul beautifully unpacks this idea of the peace that we so desperately need. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 18. Don't want to miss this. 
Ephesians 2, 11 to 18, Paul writes, Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit, to the Father. So, so did you catch that? That peace, shalom, is not the absence of conflict or war. It's the presence of something else. Jesus. You see, what Jesus came to bring to mankind was peace with God. Peace with with God. It's what we needed most. What, what we needed most was not deliverance from physical oppression, but rather deliverance from spiritual oppression. What we needed most was not the absence of conflict or war, but rather the presence of God. That's, that's the peace we needed that Jesus came to bring. The Jews didn't understand that. They, they wanted a Messiah who would come to destroy their enemies, the Romans, right? But Jesus comes along and he destroys the enemies that we needed to have destroyed the most, sin and death. Jesus becomes our peace. And the beautiful thing about the, the gospel is that our, our faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ as the payment for our sin brings us that peace with God that we so desperately need and crave. We, we are no longer enemies with God. We now have access freely to the Father because of Jesus. And, and though we still live in a world without peace, we have faith that no matter what circumstances we might encounter, what circumstances we might encounter, God is faithful. God is good. God will keep you. God will never forsake you. God is working all things for your good and, and his glory. This is, this is a faith that can survive in the hospital room, in the cemetery, and when the finances are depleted and when family dynamics get the better of you, this, this is a faith that, that relies on the promise that Jesus came to be our Prince of Peace. And, and though everything in our world is, is screaming that peace is unachievable or that God and, and religion is destroying our peace, we know that it's peace with God that we so desperately need and crave because once we have peace with God, all other things fall into their proper place. Something, I, uh, something I've struggled with at various points in my life is anxiety. Uh, there have been uh, numerous times when I've been brought to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, when, when I've been in a, a fit of anxiety. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, that peace of God, that shalom, as it were, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, it's easy to say, don't be anxious, right? We, we can say, you know, don't be anxious, or I shouldn't be anxious, or don't be anxious about anything. But it's much harder to do, isn't it? And I know for myself, it's because I think that I, I shouldn't struggle with anxiety. It's like, in order for me to be a good Christian, anxiety shouldn't be an issue for me, but that's not what God promises us. God doesn't promise to take away our anxiety, 
he promises to be our peace when life or anxiety gets to be too much. Though Jesus promised his followers that we would face hardship and persecution and betrayal, we can have faith that God is enough for us in all of it. And, and, and how this ties in to Advent, because that kind of leaves this a little bit open-ended. How this ties into Advent is that we can have faith that Jesus is coming again to completely wipe away the oppression and the unrest and the violence and the anxiety. Everlasting peace is not simply this ideal that mankind longs for, but it's something that Christ is actually bringing to this world. It started when the angels said that this baby is bringing peace on earth and it will be brought to completion when Christ returns. And that's what Advent does. It gets us to celebrate the peace we have now, that peace with God that we so desperately needed and crave. And it gets us to expect that God is going to, to bring it to completion when he returns, when we won't have to deal with anxiety or unrest or oppression. It, it ties it all together. And that, that faith in Jesus is what carries us through all the hardship and the persecution and the oppression. When, when the angels announced the Savior's birth to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased, they, they were announcing the birth of the only one who could give us true peace in this life and in the next. The only one. And, and you, can, you can try and find peace in all that this life has to offer, but you will be disappointed because you will be searching for something that has already come near to you in the person of, of Jesus Christ. This, this Christmas, if you have not done so already, will you receive that peace with God that can only be found through Jesus? Will that be a decision you make this Christmas. It's, it's nothing we did or, or could ever do ourselves. It's, it's what is being done for us. Right, right now, everything might look dark and hopeless, but maybe today is the day that you put your faith in Jesus and allow him to be your light in the darkness. Maybe, maybe today is the day that Jesus becomes your peace with God. Because until we grab hold of this peace, we will always be anxious. Anxious about uh, where we are headed when we die. Anxious about where our next meal is going to come from. Maybe even anxious about what this Christmas will be like. Always, always anxious. But when Jesus is your peace, our peace, my peace, there is confidence that you can have in the face of uncertainty. It doesn't, it doesn't take away the uncertainty here and now, but it gives you the confidence that no matter what you face in this life, God will forever be your peace and he will fight for you and he will be enough for you because he is your peace when there might otherwise be no sign of peace. So this Christmas, will you make the decision to receive the peace with God that you so desperately need, so desperately crave. You might not even know it. But will you do that this Christmas? It, it just might be the most important decision you ever make. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in a season when every heart should be happy and light. Many of us are struggling with, with the heaviness of life. It's at this time that we need your peace, Jesus. We, we confess that our hearts are too often filled with wonder of a different kind, wondering when the bills will be paid, when the terror will stop, when rest will come. In a world where worry, not peace, prevails, stir up that good news of great joy again. God, make, make this Advent real in our hearts. 
God, thank you for the gift of Jesus, our, our Emmanuel, the, the Word made flesh. Your name is still called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We, we know that peace on earth can only come when our, our hearts find peace with you. You're, you are not just some baby in a manger. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, and, and we celebrate you as Lord, this Christmas and always. And we anticipate when you as Lord will come again to completely restore and complete the work that you started. And so it is in the glorious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.